Hey oh my there, gosh. my name's Ken Moorish. And I'm Jay Nicholas. And he's the author of Modern Steelhead Flies, and uh, I'm at Fly Water Travel. Hey, I hold, hold on, hold on. Is uh, don't forget Rob Russell. He's more than more than carried the load on that thing. Yeah, but he's not here. So That's he's right. Sort Rob of irrelevant, here. but uh, yeah. Well, we're here to answer your fly tying questions. We've had some really interesting questions sent in, and. Uh, Hey, do you want to give it a go with the first one? I, I will. It's right up my alley. <laughs> uh, at Raging River Sales. Uh, hey, Ashland Fly Shop. Thanks for putting Jan Ken on live. Both are amazing. Thank you, Eric. Uh, one question for Jay, as his clouses are among the best I've ever seen. Here it comes. How does he the, select the right amount of bucktail? Well, Eric, here's the deal. I don't know if you asked the right question or not. There, there's two things. One is the right amount, and then the other is the right, uh, uh, the right properties of the bucktail. So it doesn't do any good to talk about amount of bucktail unless you get one that's got the right kind of hair. And so I've got a couple of examples here, and, and I'm sure you can't see them, but. Uh, and I, I don't know why I don't have chartreuse and white. I got olive and orange. But the point is, they both look great from a distance. This one, the, the end, the tips of the hair are kind of wispy. Uh, some bucktails it will be the super, super long hair and really curly. You don't want it super long. You don't want it super curly. You don't want it too wispy. This one is just perfect. Now, the, the other thing is, and I'm getting there, Eric. I usually don't use this much of the bucktail for my clousers. Why? Because it's, it's uh, hollower, it's going to flare more, it, it's more like deer body hair. So I will, I'll usually tie my clousers from about two-thirds of the tail down. And uh, now, to, as, as to the right amount, buddy, <laughs> um, if you're fishing dirty water, you probably want more. If you're fishing clear water, it's amazing how little, uh, how little bucktail you can use and have a very effective fly, and how little flash you can use. That said, I've, I fish clousers anywhere from that long, tied with synthetics, to little bitty ones with like so few strands of bucktail on it, I don't even talk, want to talk about it. So I've gone on too long. That's what I think about that. <laughs> Nicely done. Uh, interestingly, the same uh, question, uh, a different question from the same person, Eric at Raging Rivers. Uh, for Ken, what is his secret to shaping his foam flies? Thanks a ton. I would say uh, primarily patience and sharp scissors. Uh, uh, things like the Dr. Slick razor scissors are some of my best friends. And uh, yeah, if you're gonna do things like foam bodies for a hopper, there's a lot of beveling, there's a lot of trimming. It, it takes a little bit of time. Uh, people used to ask where was the uh, razor cutout for those and how they got it, and I would laugh because there wasn't one, but now there actually is one, and you can get that through Wopsy. If you really can't figure out how to cut a piece of foam for a mouse, which is just two angles and a square head, you can buy one for that. But the really valuable ones are the hopper ones because uh, forming the hopper bodies is uh, a total nuisance and I'm glad I don't have to do it anymore. Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm, uh, I'm actually going to jump down a little bit to uh, uh, at Mike Casting Flies. Hi Mike. When using bead heads for flies, i.e. sylvanator leech patterns, this is going to be an easy one. What's the best approach to protect the paint on the bead? They always chip within the first few casts, and then I start to lose confidence in them. So, two answers. One is, uh, the best way to avoid shipping beads is keep the flies in your box, in your boat, in your vest. Don't fish them. <laughs> But I don't think that's going to work. So, just like in the last uh, couple days, wh where are my props here? Uh, guys, move my props around. Uh, 
this isn't a sales job, but the question came in. So Pro Sport Fisher has these flexi beads. And uh, so there, 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 were, there were two problems with the old beads. Uh, one was that they didn't always fit, and two is that they would chip. So now we've got these pro, you know, this is part of the addiction process. Um, these beads are guaranteed they fit on, on all of the Pro Sport Fisher, uh, the micro tube, nano tube, classics, 4040s. Two sizes, bunch of colors, and they are super hard, and they're, you know, they're way better. So, um, enough said. Problem solved. There you go. That's nice. And I think sometimes you can also put a coating, you know, over a bead. You can get like a UV resin, put a little thin coat, zap it. You can put a little epoxy on there if you don't have a already pre-made bead that's great. You just uh, paint it. You could even hit it with a little... Uh, clear nail polish, any of those things help a bit. It just depends how much you whack your fly in the rocks. Uh, uh, my next question um, is from some elaborate email that I can't read <laughs> off. Uh, uh, what diameter thread and or brand do I use for spinning deer hair flies, tying intruders, or big saltwater flies, and how important is it to tie with? Uh, so. I don't know, a lot of different great threads out there. I have been impressed by the advent of these Vivas products. Uh, the thing that's interesting about those is you can tie with a much smaller diameter than historically available. So typically you have to tie with some, you know, three-aught thread or something to spin hair or Kevlar or something like that. And that stuff's cumbersome to tie with. Now with stuff like Vivas, you can tie with you know, a six aught or an eight aught, and, and you're hard pressed to break that stuff. When you're really getting down to, to cranking on deer hair flies and, and putting a tremendous amount of tension and doing a lot of material there, you do need to up the diameter a bit so you don't slice through the deer hair. You know, I'm not a, a deer hair master, but those guys who really get after it and pack that stuff in, they're putting a lot of heat on it and they need some diameter of that. But, you know, I don't mind now tying uh, intruders or selected saltwater patterns with, with as low as, you know, 8 aught or even 10 aught thread. You can get away with that. And so, yeah, we've got a lot of, a lot of good choices now. Yeah. So I'm going to take, take a crack at this. Do. Trizzle. Faux Shizzle 5588. Five, eight. Takes a lot of courage to have a <laughs> handle like that. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like Kenny. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert at, uh, at spinning deer hair. Um, I've tied uh, quite a few intruders. I've tied some saltwater flies. Um, I, I think it's, um, I've never had to use stuff like Kevlar. Um, I, I don't like that stuff, but it may have its place with, with certain patterns. Um, for intruders, uh, I learned from YouTube, uh, Trevor Kovich and uh, Jerry French like uh, Danville 210 flat wax. Mm. I use that quite a bit. Uh, I uh, also, I, I like to, um, when I'm not doing a real heavy compo uh, composite loop, uh, I can use a 6 dot. I can use an 8 dot. Um, so de depending on your composite loops, you, and the, the other thing is a as you get to using heavier thread, maybe you need that in your loop, but as you get towards the front of the fly, you may shift to a, a finer thread Absolutely. so you don't have a big thread buildup. Yeah. And then for saltwater flies, I usually wind up using a, I think it's a Danville, uh, mono mono thread uh, and I tie kinky uh, muddlers and all sorts of saltwater flies and, and do just fine. So I'm not really, I'm putting quite a bit of pressure on it. Um, so um, I don't know if that's helped or, or not, but yeah, we grambled. Good. That's good and, and you know so the only disadvantage of some of these more modern high-tech threads is they tend to be quite round in profile yeah. and, that, and that's why you know Kovic and stuff might go for these flat waxed threads because the other stuff can sort of stack up and then slide off and become problematic. So it, yeah. it is a little bit squirrely. Yeah. 
All right, you're up. Well, let's see what I got here. Where am I up? You're up. Let's, let's pretend you're up. Sure. Uh, 400 grains to freedom. That does not sound like freedom to me. Uh, uh, what, if any, preferences do you have on fly size, color, and water conditions? Uh, I.e., what patterns do you prefer under clear and low cold conditions, or what color and size uh, during higher water events? Well, first, if I could choose a preference, I'd choose my water conditions as my preference, and I don't really like low water all that much, uh, but that's not always a choice. I tend to, in low water steelhead fishing, I do tend to downsize. It'll depend if it's winter or summer, but you know, I do like throwing flies that are, oh, you know, under two inches, um, inch and a half, sometimes all the way down to an inch. You know, sometimes in summer fishing, I'll move into more natural color spectrums. I'll move away from the gaudier stuff. I'll play with olives. I'll play with blacks and browns. I'll move into a more buggy, sort of trouty spectrum, something that, you know, doesn't really scare the fish and something that can enter into its environment pretty innocuously. And uh, sort of just the opposite in higher water conditions. Uh, Obviously, I want to throw a, a larger profile, something more like a, an intruder. I do want to stick to dark colors. I like blacks. I like purples. I also like those types of color combinations, maybe with a highlight of pink. So I'm always a fan of, of uh, black with pink highlights. I fish that with a lot of confidence. And uh, yeah, the dirtier the water, the pushier I want the fly to be, so I might uh, yeah, have a, a harsher profile or a bigger support structure under that fly to make it noisier and to move more water. Well, what, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the only, I, I add just a couple things. Uh, I was fishing high dirty water one time on the North Umpqua with a big, beautiful, pushy black leech. And I'm swinging through this run and I get this little, just pull. I make another cast and I get this little just pull three times. My buddy Ron, Ron comes along behind me with a uh, size four, probably this big. My fly was probably this big. Uh, I, I can't, uh, the best I can describe it was a brown bucktail. Hmm. Brown, brown chenille body, uh, brown uh, hair wing. Hook three fish behind me. So I mean, it, it just—I I mean, I totally agree with with Ken, um, but you know, these fish—they—they uh, they, will—they uh, will do what they want to do. And we always, you know, have these assumptions that, uh, you know, we're worried sometimes that a fish can't see a fly, that it's not oh. big enough, and all this, and you know, they can they can see and sense things that we can't even imagine. And so, yeah, our, our assumptions do get in our way. But when the name of the game is fishing with confidence, yeah, scale it down in low water, scale it up in big water. That, at least, is what I think works. And so I do it, and I I, I think I'm fishing at my best that way, but I certainly yeah. can't No, I, 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 <laughs> I agree with your exactly. theories totally. <laughs> Okay, I will, uh, I'll, I'll take a shot at one uh, Worthington Fly Fisher. Jay, your books inspire tires to use new materials and new combinations and ways. Any tips for the steelhead tire struggling to find their creative side and put their mark on the flies they tie? So that's it, a really good question. So um, I'm gonna offer a couple of observations. Uh, one is, um, uh, what is one? Oh my God, I forgot. Okay, it's, it's really difficult to come up, I remember now, it's difficult to come up with new fly patterns. Uh, an awful lot, well, well that's, that's true in, in phases. We had years when we had a whole, f all our steelhead flies were pretty much alike, green butt skunk, red butt skunk, skunk. Uh, burlap, um, golden demon, uh, sky combish sunrise thor, they were all very similar. 
then we entered a different era and we got marabou and ostrich and two station flies and now they all look like that. Uh, so, so there was some brand new stuff came along and now we're all trying to adapt in that new style. So, uh, so what I wanted to, to observe was if you go to 10 different tires, people that tie a lot, and you ask them to tie the same pattern, give them all the same materials, they're going to look different. Each tire has their own, uh, their own flair uh, and their own little techniques, even if, even if you try to create the same thing. So I'd suggest picking about three color themes. And, and the color themes you use are, uh, is up to you. Maybe black and blue, um, uh, pink and orange, uh, maybe a purple, uh, or, or olive and brown. Pick three themes and then just tie flies and experiment with different materials and make them small, make them big, weight them, keep them light, and, and work on those three ones and just have fun with it and develop your own style. Yeah, stylistically, I'd agree. I think that, you know, I think that the harder part of his question is, is you know, how do you do something to put your mark on, uh, you know, I'd say it's, it's very difficult to come up with something truly new and innovative. You know, there have only been a few things along the way that have been new and innovative. You know, a two-stage intruder, oh, that's new and innovative. Uh, uh, a, a string leech or a trailing hook, yeah. that was innovative at one point. Uh, you know, so, but those big landmark moves are really few and far between in the industry, and so I think that he's right. Develop your style, develop your look, and, uh, and if you keep going and you find a place where you're comfortable and you keep applying that to your patterns, eventually, you know, people with a discerning eye will be able to see that and go, oh, that, that looks like, mm -hmm. that looks like Jay tied that. And, you know, you and I are probably pretty good at looking at flies and going, oh yeah, we know who tied that. And that's, that's fun when, when you develop that for yourself. Uh, this question is also from uh, Brandon Worthington. Uh, what were the top three most pivotal or inspirational patterns that you can look to that changed your tying trajectory? Or maybe three patterns you fished but thought you could improve upon, and what were the outcomes? It's a really complicated question for me. Uh, uh, but, you know, I do remember in the early days, you know, seeing, uh, you know, Howells and Ward's intruders and them showing them to me and you know that that kind of blew my mind and I was like wow that that's different and new and you know initially um, I tried to make a simplified version of of that that would be commercially appropriate and so you know the messy fly like trailer trash you know that was just a really dumbed down two-stage fly that could be made inexpensively. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, it's not a fly that I'm particularly proud of, but it served a function, fished well, and again, you know, inexpensive to produce for the masses. You know, another fly that was really uh, influential for me in my trout fishing was Cowbird's Bird's Nest. And so, you know, growing up in California and doing a lot of nymph fishing, um, that fly was, was real serious medicine for me. I was like, man, that thing really works. And so, um, you know, the first royalty fly I ever designed was called a Dirty Bird. And it was a simplified, it wasn't a simplified, it was a variant of Cowbird's fly. And it used, you know, softer hackle. It used partridge as opposed to a wood duck. And um, it used more interesting dubbings like, you know, Whitlock's SLF, and then, you know, I modified that into a black bead because, you know, I never saw, I was never a big fan of gold beads because I'd never seen a bug with a big gold head on it, and uh, yeah, and so that was a fly that had a lot of impact for me, and 
continues to be a real go-to nymph for me. If I don't want to make a decision, I just want to go fishing, I fish that fly. So that had a good outcome. And then I'd say the other, you know, flies that I really wanted to improve upon were sort of, uh, you know, in the foam arena and the hopper arena and um, in trying to improve upon that, you know, that, that gave me a long time to sort of ruminate on what does a grasshopper look like and after looking at one stuck with a pin on my desk for about four months, <laughs> uh, you know, I started sculpting foam with scissors, you know, gluing it together, cutting it up, and I was like, oh yeah, now I can finally make this shape. But I couldn't figure out a way to do it conventionally. And so that was one that I wanted to improve upon. And you know, my favorite story is that that fly, when I first submitted it to Idlewild at the time, they rejected it and told me that foam was dead and <laughs> that fly was <laughs> stupid and, that, oh, and, uh, and I was pissed. I didn't, didn't submit flies to them for about two years and then I resubmitted it and it became their, their best-selling fly of uh, all time. So that was my... Uh, Am I getting even? I yeah, get yeah. <laughs> that was a good job of getting even. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna jump in. Scott Crosby writes, yeah, yeah, one more guys. Do you prefer shanks or tubes and why? So let me just grab a couple things here. We got some tubes and we got some shanks. Uh, Aquafies, uh, OPST, Pro Sport Fisher. What do I prefer? I like them both. Um, I, for me, the tubes are easier to tie on. Uh, I don't don't have to deal with. Uh, now I've never been very good at the uh, authentic way of rigging uh, shanks with a little bit of tube on the back and run the leader up over the fly and out the back. I, I normally, I lash on, you know, I use intruder wire or Power Pro or something like that. And that's an extra step. So if I was good at traditional rigging, um, there's something about an intruder tied on a shank because it's, it's, a, narrow, it's a finer base, it looks, looks really cool. So when you, it's just like when you, any fly you tie on a different hook, you can tie it the same materials, it will look different. So intruders tied on tubes look different than intruders tied on shanks. Um, and some people just like one, you know, we tend to fall into habits and we might be OPST guys, or Aquaflies guys, or Pro Sport Fisher guys. Um, I like them all. I think they all fish well. Um, I think with tubes, you have to be more thoughtful about how your fly is going to penetrate the water column, mm -hmm. because tubes are neutral buoyancy, so you got to think about, you put no weight on it, you put a little bit, you put a lot. Whereas with the shanks, it's, it seems more intuitive that your fly is gonna fish at the right level. Well, I think the other key to that <clears throat> is that, you know, the big difference to me between tubes and intruders in a <clears throat> fishing context is that an intruder you can tie onto with a loop knot. Mm -hmm. And a tube is going all the way through. So a tube is gonna tend to sink more laterally or in a more balanced fashion where an intruder with lead eyes may drop and then sink. So I think it can penetrate more mm -hmm. quickly mm -hmm. and it can have more motion in the water. Not that it's going to have a lot of motion once it's under tension and so you know a lot of people go oh, it moves around a lot and that's why there's a loop knot. When the current's pulling on it you know it's, it's pretty straight but it's going to have more motion it's going to penetrate a little bit differently and then you know the other awkward thing is that some people don't know what to do with tubes. Like, a tube is a mental transition. It's like, I gotta figure out, oh, where I keep my connective tubing and my, and my tube hooks, and how do I store my tubes in my box? Or, <laughs> and and so, so just shifting into tube mentality is, is it's just a psychological shift, and I still sort of wrestle with it. I think tubes make more sense. I think they're easier to tie with. 
uh, and still I want to have you know my my classic intruders around and I sort of think that they're big medicine and special and um, aesthetically I'm more accustomed to them and I'm getting more and more accustomed to the aesthetics of of tubes because uh, I think that the Scandinavian tires are adding so much to the tube movement and that stuff. It just really looks good now. And there was a time when it all looked funny to me. I'm just yeah. slowly adjusting. Yeah. All right. Answered that one perfectly. <laughs> Ten points. Uh, what, do, what do you got? I'll, uh, I'll jump in one. Uh, Greg Glassup, mm. what are your favorite tried and true low water patterns to stick to? Is it better to stick to summer color patterns in low water in the winter? Oh, so there's two different questions. What's your favorite for uh, summer? Um, I'm going to jump in here. Uh, I would feel, in summer low water. I'd feel really good fishing a silver Hilton, uh, a burlap, a muddler, and I might surprise some people a royal coachman. Uh, Always work, always will. Um, so summer, and I think I think Kenny mentioned uh, much smaller in the summer, uh, sixes, eights, um, and very little flash, just maybe no flash. Uh, so in the winter, um, I, I think I'm like a lot of people. I haven't fished my summer flies in the winter. I think they would fish really well. But in winter, I tend to go um, sparse, orange and red, uh, olive, uh, and brown. Those are, those are my low clear water flies in the winter. Yeah, I always do really crappy in low water in the winter. So <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't I say I did, yeah. I did I well. Know, but, and, I, and I sometimes sort of uh, fall back on more shrimpy tie, uh, mm -hmm. ties just because they tend to be sparse and they tend to be, yeah, maybe, you know, in a lighter pink. But I would say that, yeah, in terms of colors, my color choices shift depending on my distance from salt water. And so, you yeah. know, the further inland I am, the darker I fish, the closer to salt I am, the brighter or more pinky hmm. orange I tend to do, but hmm. I, I sort of move away from those more vibrant colors as I get further inland. Yeah, makes sense. Let's see what else we got. So, Mike Nelson writes, what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? So, uh, being dedicated to give you an answer for every question, <laughs> even though I have no idea what an unladen swallow is, I, I would say that the velocity, airspeed would be approximately equal to my Ford cast with a Wolf neutralizer uh, fly line and a nine foot leader and a size two clouser. There you go. That's what I was thinking <laughs> also. <laughs> Uh, I got a question from uh, Johnny King here. Uh, curious about your experience with crossover flies, in particular steelhead type patterns for trout. Uh, other than micro intruder type flies, are you borrowing from traditional steelhead feather wings and hair wings and the like for trout? Using the crazy steelhead com combinations for trout, using baby salmon hooks for trout swing flies. Thanks. Sadly, I'm not very qualified to answer that. You know, I, I think that uh, if I'm doing traditional swing fishing for trout, I tend to end up more in the soft hackle realm and tying small streamers in the trouty fashion. I tend to use, yeah, mostly soft hackle stuff like uh, dirty birds or unweighted ones or small light leeches that I can throw with, with small spays. And so I haven't experimented a lot with that. If I did more of that fishing, you know, boy, I think that these attractive traditional old school wet flies like lead wing coachman and yeah. things like that, tying those on these 
more stylized salmon and steelhead hooks. I think that would be a lot of fun. I'd like to get more into that, but I don't have a lot of first-hand experience to back it up. Well, neither do I, but I, I have YouTube as, as, <laughs> as my resource. So I've, I've spent a lot of time on YouTube, and I've searched... Um, uh, go on and you, you search, uh, what was it, trout streamers, uh, trout swing flies, and people are doing it a lot, and they're having a lot of fun with it, and I've talked to a few guys who do it, and there seems to be, uh, they do not seem to be using the, say, the black and blue or uh, uh, purple. They're not using the pinks and reds. They're, they're not using the, the vibrant steelhead colors. Uh, right. But they're really heavy to um, rabbit leech, <laughs> uh, but not necessarily you know the quarter inch, but maybe the eighth inch or uh, pine squirrel uh, strips, and they're using olives or or sometimes they're using uh, yellows and yellows and whites or yellows and reds. Browns, yeah. yeah, the browns. You know, cr crayfish imitations or all whites uh, to imitate little shiners and things. So they're, they're uh, and, and it's, it's really interesting, the fly, the commercial flies that, that are selling well and apparently producing, some of them are dressed really heavy. Uh, it's like a big wad of material on there. And sometimes they have a lot of flash. But, but the ones that I'm more attracted to swinging for, for trout, which I haven't done, would be the, the more, the rabbit leech type things. Uh, and, and the traditional soft tackles. Yeah, a piece of barred rabbit on a hook. Yeah, starts. <laughs> <laughs> that gets it done. Hard to beat. Well, did we exhaust all of our questions? Yeah, I think we, uh, think we did pretty good. We hey, well, pretty good. we thank most of you for your questions. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I hope that was somewhat informative. And uh, thanks for the Ashland Fly Shop for putting this on. Thanks yeah. for coming down and seeing us here. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>